Welcome back, mitochondriacs, for another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. I want to continue on our discussion about the inhibition of glutamine, and in particular, this glutamine cysteine antiporter named SLC7A11, and its critical importance for not only the exchange of glutamine and cysteine, but also the creation of the intracellular glutathione that is required by cancer cells to maintain their redox homeostasis and to protect against lipid peroxidation and ferroptosis. And I'm going to show some additional evidences of how important and how critical this one transporter is seemingly shaping to be. So let's get into it. So this paper is titled Amino Acid Transporter SLC7A11 XCT at the Crossroads of Regulating redox homeostasis, and nutrient dependency of cancer. And it says here that SLC7A11 promotes cysteine uptake and glutathione biosynthesis, resulting in the protection from oxidative stress and ferroptotic cell death. Recent studies have unexpectedly revealed that SLC7A11 also plays critical roles in glutamine metabolism and regulates the glucose and glutamine dependency of cancer cells. And what we see here in this graphic, essentially, is that because of the aberrant metabolism of cancer cells, there actually ends up being a lot more oxidative stress within the cellular milieu. And oxidative stress is going to activate or overactivate this NRF2 pathway, which in general, for prevention standpoint, is something that we want to actually harness and utilize so that we can protect ourselves from oxidative stress. But cancer cells do it in an order of magnitude greater than what would be seen in a normal cell. And what it's doing is it's at least one of the gene products from NRF2 is this SLCA11 mRNA, which gets transcribed into making the actual protein itself, which gets translocated to the cell membrane and acts as this cysteine glutamate antiporter. And this transporter becomes critically important for the biosynthesis of glutathione, which allows the cancer cell to have a high strength of essentially a shields against oxidative stress that's endogenous to that cancer cell, but also to exogenous insults of oxidative stress, which can be employed as cancer therapy. And that's exactly what this particular graphic also shows. We see an oxidative stress or a metabolic stress, and then SLC7A11 essentially is going to bring in the necessary cysteine, which when combined with glutamine and glycine is able to form glutathione and help block lipid peroxidation, which ultimately will lead to ferroptotic cell death. This paper here is titled SLC7A11 as a gateway of metabolic perturbation and ferroptosis vulnerability in cancer cells. And it says SLC7A11 is overexpressed in various human cancers and regulates tumor development, proliferation, metastases, microenvironment, and treatment resistance. Upregulation of SLC7A11 in cancers is needed to adapt in high oxidative stress microenvironments and maintain cellular redox homeostasis. High basal ROS levels and SLC7A11 dependencies in cancers render them vulnerable to further oxidative stress. Therefore, cysteine depletion may be an effective new strategy for cancer treatment. And I think this brings me to take a pause for a second and address some of the really good, but also really nuanced questions that I've been seeing in the comments. And there have been some frustrations from folks in the comments because they're like, well, you know, Seafried's talking about being on a ketogenic diet and Seafried's talking about glutamine deprivation. And now we're talking about cysteine and now we're talking about glycine. There's other people who are talking about methionine. And I get it, I get the frustration. First of all, I'm not recommending anything, but what I'm not saying, is to specifically restrict cysteine, methionine, glycine from foods. That would be difficult, if not impossible. I have mentioned in comments that if it was me and I had cancer, I would not want to be taking a glutamine supplement, a glycine supplement, a glynac supplement, an NAC supplement by itself. Those, to me, seems like that would be extremely dangerous, and it would be like shooting myself in the foot Preventive medicine, different story. However, what is true is that a therapeutic ketogenic diet is a low protein diet. It's got about a five to 10% total caloric intake or ratio 
of protein. So you're not going to be getting a lot of glutamine, cysteine, glycine on those kind of diets. I will be the first to tell you that these kind of diets are not sustainable for a long period of time, but they can be utilized in a way that achieves the objectives. And the objectives is to restrict glucose mostly to lower insulin and to lower insulin-like growth factors, which affect a whole host of chemical signaling pathways. The other goal is to raise ketone levels. That's one of the main goals of the ketogenic diet. When it comes to glutamine restriction, it's almost impossible to restrict glutamine on a diet. First of all, glutamine is a non-essential amino acid. Therefore, your body can make its own glutamine or it can salvage it from somewhere else in the body, which is one of the mechanisms behind cancer cachexia is that essentially the glutamine from muscle tissue is being robbed both in the bloodstream and from the breakdown of muscle in a catabolic physiology. So therefore, restricting dietary glutamine above and beyond a therapeutic ketogenic diet, which is a low protein diet to begin with, is not even feasible. What is feasible is looking at these transporters, SLC7A11, for example, and looking at ways that we can inhibit the excess glutamine uptake by cancer cells. Remember, they're bringing in glutamine about 10 to 30 times more than a normal cell. So what we're trying to do is stop the influx and potentially stop the utilization by the glutaminase enzyme and the glutamine dehydrogenase enzymes that we've talked about both with Dawn and with EGCG. That is the goal here. And when we restrict glutamine's uptake and utilization, then this process happens without us having to do a whole lot else. I hope that clarifies it to some degree. And this is another paper essentially showing us a very similar thing, right? We have this cysteine antiporter that is actually taking in the excess glutamine that is found in the cancer cells and removing some of it so we can bring in cysteine. And then cysteine is combining with glutamine to make glutathione with the addition of glycine at a later step. Remember, that will require NADPH, which is one of the big reasons why cancer cells require excess amounts of glucose which gets run through the PPP, which we've talked about in prior videos. And that's going to help protect against ferroptosis. And what this paper is called is cysteine transporter SLC7A11 in cancer, ferroptosis, nutrient dependency, and cancer therapy. And it says that the cysteine glutamate antiporter SLC7A11, also commonly known as XCT, functions to import cysteine for glutathione biosynthesis and antioxidant defense and is overexpressed in multiple human cancers. Recent studies revealed that SLC7A11 overexpression promotes tumor growth partly through suppressing ferroptosis, a form of regulated cell death induced by excessive lipid peroxidation. However, cancer cells with high expression of SLC7A11 also have to endure the significant cost associated with SLC7A11-mediated metabolic reprogramming, leading to a glucose and glutamine dependency in SLC7A11 high cancer cells, which presents potential metabolic vulnerabilities for therapeutic targeting of SLC7811 cancer. Now, some of the other important questions and criticisms that I've had in the comments is that a lot of the work in the earlier part of this series were papers published by Seafried and his group up at Boston College. And the issue with that is that, is this siloed information? Is this an echo chamber, essentially? Are we just presenting evidence from one group with the findings that these cancer cells are reliant on glucose and glutamine? And I hope that I have shown, not only is that not true, by showing a variety of publications, which in their own little pieces and parts show the exact same findings that Seafried and his group have found, but from a variety of different journals, from a variety of different primary investigators and investigative groups to help show that this is widely accepted as being true. The question is, how are we going to address it? And I do believe that the major reason why a lot of these publications are coming to light is because ultimately pharma wants to use chemotherapy or immunotherapy in the treatment of cancer like it's been doing for a long, long time. But the problem is chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and radiotherapy resistance. And I think that they're seeing a huge opportunity here with this ferroptosis concept 
and the ability to essentially utilize metabolic therapy in a way that allows their therapies to have an effect, which ultimately proves the point in a roundabout way of what Dr. Seyfried has been talking about for a long time. And that is that when glucose and glutamine are restricted in various ways, cancer cells cannot survive the high basal or baseline ROS, RNS, internal state of a cancer cell. Now, if we were able to restrict their ability to protect themselves against that basal or baseline high ROS, RNS, oxidative environment, then we're going to leave them highly vulnerable to pretty much whatever we throw at them. So this is why Dr. Seafried's initial framework makes so much sense because if you were to use, for example, high dose IV vitamin C, which is an oxidative therapy or photodynamic therapy or hyperbaric oxygen therapy in a vacuum without adding the secret sauce of the ketogenic diet and restricting glutamine uptake and utilization, you would have marginal, if not very poor results because they can still protect themselves very well against those therapies because of this exact process, because of SLC7A11 and the other glutamine uptake transporters and because of KRAS and because of CMIC and because of HIF-1 and their upregulation of glutamine uptake and glutamine utilization enzymatic machinery, because of the uptake in glucose and the increases in the PPP functionality and the recycling of glutathione through the excess NADPH, they would have marginal effects. But when you lower the shields and you make them susceptible, even much more susceptible than a normal cell would be, then these oxidative therapies, which can be much more targeted, are implemented. That's when the real magic happens of metabolic therapy. I want to end today's discussion on the last three slides here. And I think I mentioned in a prior video that when I first saw the initial graphics such as this, this classic graphic that I've been showing over and over again, that I'll continue to use because it helps all of us become oriented where we're, what we're talking about and where. But when I first saw this graphic, I saw maybe one usable compound that I could potentially, or patients could potentially have access to, and that's sulfasalazine, which I will have a video on sulfasalazine. It's an old medication. We use it for IBD or inflammatory bowel diseases. But that being said, I left looking at a slide like this fairly disheartened because there are so few things that are in our grasp to utilize clinically. However, when I see a list like this, and I see all of these small molecules that have effects on SLC7A11, which is now becoming a very, very critical transporter to highlight in this series and to talk about its therapeutic blockade. And I see so many things that are within our reach. It gives me a lot of reassurance and gives me a lot of hope. So I circled things that are fairly easy to obtain. Okay. So SAS is sulfasalazine, but there's uracilic acid, sodium butyrate, curcumin, vitamin D, tantion, ginsenoside, these saponins. Here's the compound that everybody keeps asking for, artaminazin. But did we know that EGCG also has roles on this? Again, butyrate, capsaicin, butyrate, vitamin D, tantionone, butyrate, aspirin. There are dozens, as you can see here, of compounds that have effects on these pathways. And I think it also at least partially explains why there are repurposed drugs that potentially have effects. In particular, aspirin is one of those drugs. As I can show you in a future slide, metformin is one of those drugs and has effects on the SLC7A11 pathway. So although we don't have it all figured out yet, the story is starting to come together. The pieces are starting to fit together. And if we can just hold on and let science continue to investigate other small molecule inhibitors that have already been proven to be exceedingly safe, which have effects on these pathways, it helps us understand why these things have a potential to work for these other conditions in which they were never designed for. I hope I have made the case that SLC7A11, that this 
Glumine cysteine antiporter is critically important. It may be out of all of the glutamine transporters that we've seen so far, it may be the most important. It also may be the transporter that is the most susceptible to a variety of compounds, some of which we've covered in the past and some of which we've not covered and we will be covering in the days and weeks ahead. If you like videos like this, please like, share, subscribe, and until next time.